All right, now it's official. Welcome back. Happy Garbage Day. It's, it's a thing. It's a lovely Tuesday afternoon. Thanks for joining us. We have, let's see. We have a formative assessment. That's what I forgot to open. I was looking at all my files going, I know I'm forgetting something and I just remembered what it is. So let me get that open and that's where we will start. And, Zoomers, let me get the screen share going. I should be able to see this one. Number four. So I can't see my formative assessment. You, you can't see it? Yeah, it's like locked in terms of like, I can't see what I responded. On the other ones, I can. Oh. And then it says crickets. <laughs> okay. Does yeah, everyone else have that same you. problem? No. You can't see what you said? No. Okay, let me fix it. With the last, with assignment three, I had the same problem. Okay. Well, y'all should tell me this. I can fix it. Well, let that's me. weird because I can see three. <laughs> I can. Let students see their quiz responses. Ah, I unchecked that box. That is the problem. Oh. Okay. And you said you couldn't do it for three either? Okay, let me fix it for three. Because that was not my intent. I want to make sure that everybody can see things. I don't have an answer key, so it's not like there's anything. Um, okay. No, three, I have that, that box is checked on three. So it should be okay. Okay, did that fix it? Okay. Yes. Good. One problem solved. Okay. There. Are we good to talk about this then? Formative assessment number four? All right. I read through these this morning and I updated grades for everything that um, has been submitted that's been due. So homework four is outstanding still. Homework three, I am working my way through. I'm halfway done grading. My hope is to wrap that up tomorrow and be able to get you feedback by the end of the week so that you'll have a chance to turn it back around if you wish to do a revision. So far, it looks like everybody is doing a really good job and I'm quite pleased. So I, I don't expect a, a lot of revision effort to be made. So question number one on formative assessment number four, talking about IRT parameterization. So a lot of, uh, a lot of you got this one exactly right. What, how do we define A and B? For binary responses. What's A? Discrimination. Discrimination. What is the definition of A? The slope of the curve at the inflection point. Yeah. Yes. The slope of the curve at the inflection point and the inflection point is at B, which is where the probability of a either a correct response or a probability of endorsing the item. So if you think of it as like a symptom checklist or something where people can say, yes, I have this, or no, I don't have this, where the probability is 50-50, which corresponds to a logit or probit of what? Zero, yes. That's foreshadowing for the next question, you see. Good, so A is a slope. And discrimination, more is better, right? Steeper slope, better item, more related to the trait but only related in its area where the B is. So related at that point is one of the key differences between these types of models for binary responses and the CFA models that assume responses are continuous. The slope keeps going if it's continuous. How about B then? How do I think about B? The difficulty location. It's, what is it? The difficulty location. Difficulty, you were going to say? Yeah. Difficulty, yes. Do you call it a centering parameter? Uh, no, I wouldn't call it that, but okay. you could, can if you want. I call it a location parameter. So I, so this is where um, there, the words are confusing because difficulty and discrimination are broader concepts that describe an item, 
And I would think of it as like slope and location respectively. Discrimination is slope and difficulty is location. But difficulty is the name of the B parameter specifically in this case, which makes it confusing when you think about difficulty as a concept or as this particular instantiation of the concept. So B is the amount of the trait needed to get to a probability of 50-50 or a logit probit of zero. So the way I think of it is B tells us who is this item designed for? What kind of person is this item going to be maximally useful for measuring at that B value? And I like Bs for that reason, because it characterizes what you can expect out of that item. And a higher B value is more difficult or less difficult more. So a higher B value, difficulty goes the right way. Higher B means you have, need more of the trait to get a 50-50 shot or of endorsing it or getting it correct. Uh, in a Roche model, which of these is assumed constant with, across items, A or B? A. So the one parameter model, as it's known, or the Roche model, each item still gets its own B. It's the A that is questionable. And if I want to know if each item needs a different A, what can I do? Do a nested model comparison. Yeah, likelihood ratio test where each item has its own A or they all share an A. Uh, could I have a model where some items share an A and some items get their own? I don't see why not. Yeah, if your software lets you, the answer is yes. So I, I would call that like a one and a half PL or something. Seriously, like you can do that. So that like the way that it's approached is this all or nothing. Well, they're all the same or they're all not the same. There's room for middle grounds. So if one item looks really different than all the others, maybe it gets a different A and the others share as much as they can. So it really is a function of your software package and what it allows you to do, not theoretically what's possible in terms of the model that you're building. So middle ground is possibility. Uh, C is a parameter I didn't ask about, but that's another one that shows up for binary data. What's C? Remember? Yeah, lower asymptote for guessing. So it's the, uh, the, prob the lowest probability, basically, at an infinitely low theta. What would the probability of a correct response be? Not as relevant in a non-educational context. So this is the IRT parameterization. And when people use A's and B's and they say they did IRT, what kind of estimation are they usually talking about? Full or limited? Full. Full, Full information. So, so marginal maximum likelihood or a Bayesian version of that. But the idea is that the words IRT tend to be associated with full information estimation. They tend to be associated with the model phrased in this A and B kind of way. Okay. How are we doing so far? Good. Now the next one. So out of the factor analysis tradition separately came the development of item factor analysis or factor models for categorical data as it's called. Where this parameterization, this way of thinking about the model is to make it look more like factor analysis used to look when we talked about it. So rather than having A's and B's, we would have loadings as one, and then either threshold or intercept is the other. And this version of the model is usually written as predicting the logit or the probit directly, so it looks more like a linear model. So then factor loading. What is the definition of a factor loading? Whatever, probit for whatever. The yep. increases by that much. Yep. For a one unit increase in theta, the factor loading tells us how much the predicted response, where predicted is in logits or probits, whatever you're talking about, uh, goes up. So it's a slope. And if your theta variance is one, the factor loading and the A parameter are exactly the same thing. So that one, that's easy. So we can say that's discrimination. It's literally the same as A discrimination if the scaling is the same. Now threshold. This went off the rails a little bit. 
I had many people tell me that threshold is the same as difficulty, and that is not true. What you can say about thresholds and difficulty Bs specifically is that they're both location parameters. They both talk about sort of the shift of, of the item relative to theta. Yes, and I have to act it out. Like jazz hands here. But threshold is not the same as difficulty. It's a different number. So if B is labeled difficulty and B tells us who the item is for in terms of theta, for what kind of person is this item, thresholds tell us what to expect from an average person in terms of their response. So the definition of a threshold is that it is the logit or probit of a zero answer when theta is zero. So it's still a location. It still applies to the concept of difficulty, but it's not the same thing as B difficulty specifically. And I wish the words were not so confusing, but I didn't make it up. And I, 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 I don't shoot the messenger, right? Like, I, I apologize, but this is how people talk about it. So B and threshold are not the same thing, but they're related. To get a B out of a threshold, it's threshold divided by loading. So you can get from one to the other. Do you have a question? Yes? Can you say again? Yes. Can I get my favorite picture out to do it? Okay. It's like slide 69 or something. I should know it by now. 63. Here it is. My favorite picture. Okay. So a threshold is the y-axis when x is 0. A threshold is the predicted logit of a 0 answer when theta is 0. So the threshold tells you the logit or probit of y, which is probability in this axis, but it's in logits or probits, since that's what the model is predicting directly, for theta equals 0. So thresholds tell you what to expect from the average person. They tell you the probability of failure, essentially, for the average person. And so because thresholds are talking about failure, a higher threshold means a higher probability of failure means it's a harder item. So B as in thresholds go in the same conceptual direction where more means it's harder to get it right, more likely to get it wrong. You need more theta to get it right. Yep. Yes, please. So, so for example, this one is like a zero is uh, three six. But there's a probability of y equals one. Mm -hmm. Why that is failure? Because this is an intercept, and we have to get minus one to get over here to get to be a threshold. Oh, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. Which is the second part of the question. How are thresholds and intercepts related? Yeah. Times yeah. minus one is how. Is there a math term for that? It's not inverse or reciprocal or, like, I want to say opposite that I don't think. Oh, it's the, the reflection. Reflection? Is that good? Additive inverse. <laughs> Additive <laughs> inverse? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's not better. Um, times, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with times minus one. Opposite is the way I think of it in my head because they tell you the opposite situation. So a threshold tells you the probability of failure, an intercept tells you the probability of success. But they both are talking about what that probability is for an average person, meaning theta equals zero. So logits and probits aside, they're talking, they, the logit or probit gets transformed into a probability where it's the probability of a zero is what the threshold tells you, the probability of a one is what an intercept tells you, but they're both for the average person. So intercepts are backwards in terms of higher intercepts means a higher probability of a one means it's an easier item. Higher thresholds means a higher probability of a zero means it's a harder item.
So I say they're both locations because the red and blue lines here are just different points on the x-axis. But B tells you the location at which logit probit is zero, whereas intercepts and thresholds are tied to the location of theta equals zero and tell you what happens with y instead. So the three versions of the model then are given at the top of this slide. The slope intercept parameterization, as it's called, is right here, where you have an intercept and you have a loading, and they both talk about what happens to the probability of a 1. The stupid threshold version has a negative sign in front of it because it's talking about the probability of a 0. The negative flips it back to 1, and then the, thresh, then the loading and factor talk about the probability of a 1. And then A and B is the different version of it where the negative is in here, still making it go where higher values of B mean a more difficult item, more theta it takes to get it right. I think conceptually these things made sense to me. What threw me off was the fact that line two says loading difficulty thresholds. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like difficulty in quotations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the quotes were meant to be like that's the direction it goes because difficulty is what B is called as opposed to the concept of difficulty which is a broader concept of directionality. And this is all terrible. <laughs> now why am, I, why am I hitting this so hard and so often? Do you remember why? Because people pay you to know this. Because people will pay you to know this. But how will you, this is these are the options for what your software could be giving you. That's why. So I want you to understand how these options all interrelate so that you could get the one you want if that's not the one that's provided directly. In M plus for binary models, you get all of these. It directly gives you thresholds, which you can turn into intercepts by multiplying by minus one. It directly gives you loadings, and it also will just spit out A's and B's without you even asking for it. Bad news. To fit these same models to ordinal data in M+, it does not spit out A's and B's. You have to make them yourself. With extra code, not with a calculator, but I have a spreadsheet and I have code, so you can make them yourself that way. But knowing how they interrelate allows you to then make them yourself. All things being equal, I like B's better than intercepts or thresholds because B's tell you who is that item for, and that's a useful thing to know, not what should the average person do? Well, what if you want to talk about somebody who's not average? Then what? Okay, where'd my thing go? Here we are. So yes, if your software gives you thresholds instead of intercepts, how will you know? Everything will be backwards. How, you, how would you ever figure this out if you don't have the documentation? Make up data where you know what the answer is. That's what I do. You can simulate data with known item parameters, simulate data with like enough people to where all of the measurement errors should be reduced, see what you get back. That is how I figured out what M plus does on a bunch of different things, is seeing the not, get, not getting back what I thought I was going to get and then realizing what it must be doing instead. In the real world, that's how you would figure these things out. For now, you can ask me, because they do pay me to know this. Or at least to stand up here and, like, try to know this. It took me, I think, two or three times of teaching this class, by the way, before I didn't screw this up. It, it was an iterative process. All right. Questions or things you want to hear again on number two? And when people say IFA or they say confirmatory factor analysis on categorical data, usually they're talking about limited information estimation instead. So the threshold loading version of the model is most often paired with WLSMB, or what it is called more generally is diagonally weighted least squares, DWLS. 
where that's based on the tetrachoric correlation matrix as input, and then the model gets fit to maximize the core, to best recreate those correlations. All right. Number three, reliability. No formulas needed. How is reliability different between CFA and IRT IFA? And Zoomers, I'm watching the chat too, or you can talk. Make sure I'm recording. Yeah, I am. Good. What's well, let's, let's let's start simpler then. What's the word that goes with reliability in IRT models? It starts with an I. Information. If I want to take information and convert it into a zero to one reliability metric, what do I do? Information over one plus information. Yeah, it's information over information plus one. So a little bitty formula there. Now the key idea, am I looking for a number or a function? function. Yeah, in IRT, IFA, it's a function. Because why? Reliability change. Well, information change across data. Yeah, information changes. So if I go back to my picture here, this item is only useful for people who are sort of on the lower side. Because after a theta of zero, this item doesn't discriminate amongst them anymore. More and more theta translates into very little differences in the probability. So this item is not helping people over here. Likewise, super low people would not have very much difference in their probability across theta. It's not going to help them. So the end result of having a bunch of different items that each target a section of theta is that your information or your reliability has to change depending on which items you have, where they are, and how discriminating they are in that spot. So this nonlinear relationship between theta and the probability of an item response, that's why information changes across theta. So if someone says, how reliable is your test, for whom? That's the question. In the example that I gave with the older adults, I had a very good measure of low people, but I had a terrible measure of high people. Now, in contrast, in CFA, it's one number. We compute an omega, or a factor score reliability, and it's assumed to hold throughout the trait. Because in CFA, the relationship between the trait and the response is, yeah, linear. This way? That way. This way. There we go. <laughs> Got it. I can't do spatial reasoning. I just, I can't. I, I, have, I have a disability. I can't do it. I have to physically turn around to go the right way. But yes, so that idea of a linear slope means the slope keeps discriminating all the way. And when you add up all those all the way slopes, you get a constant flat information function. So that's the assumption that we're making, is that if you have a good instrument, it's good for everybody. Now, that's probably not true, because your item responses are going to hit their boundaries at some point. But that's the assumption we make in CFA. So the translation of reliability into IRT IFA means you have to talk about where on theta and how much reliability you have at each point. So you might pick an arbitrary point like 80% reliability and say, between this range and this range, I have reliability above 0.8. Before that or after that, it falls off of 0.8. And you'll get a chance to practice figuring that out in homework four, which is ongoing. All right. And with respect to coming up with a single number for reliability, there are ways to do that. So what you would essentially have to do is figure out for each distinct value of theta that you observe in your sample. So you'd have to output the predicted thetas and then be like, okay, at this point, reliability is this much, and I've got this many people at that much, plus reliability of this many people, like basically weight the reliability by how many people are in each spot. And then you can come up with the composite reliability. That's one number. But I think that's stupid because you're missing the point, right? Like that one number doesn't describe everybody. So I feel like that hides more than it helps. So reliability is a function. That's the big picture. All right. How are we doing? Any 
other questions or things you want to talk about related to this? Parameters, such? Yes? So in terms of ordinal data. Ordinal data. Love the transition. That's where yes. we're headed next. Uh huh. Thresholds would be, is that the response and above or the response and below of the first thing? Um, like if, given this example, like mm -hmm. the threshold at, for the, the threshold estimate for selection of one, mm -hmm. does that mean zero and one or one, two, and three? Say your question again. Oh, okay. Well, what would a, if, if we estimated a threshold for option one, what does that mean? For option one? Like if, it, if it's on a scale like zero to five. Okay. Uh, thresholds are not for single options. They're okay. for submodels within a set of options. Okay. So that that's a good transition. We're talking about, I'm on slide eight here. Should we do this and I can answer your question? Do you remember the good news that I told you last time? Nothing new. Nothing new. The only, the only catch is just a relabeling of what zero and one mean as a binary answer. In my color coding scheme here, zero is red and one is blue. It used to be green, but then I thought color blindness, that's not fair, so I'm going blue and red. It's not the same blue and red as for the other class, though. It's different blue, because that's for model for the variance in that class. So if I have four categories, then it will create three submodels. Each submodel is binary, and so the model will predict the zero versus the one in each of these fashions. So the threshold for submodel one, to answer your question then, is going to describe the probability of the red at theta equals zero. The second submodel's threshold is going to describe the probability of zero and one at theta equals zero. And the third one will describe the probability of zero, one, two at theta equals zero. What if you want to do the opposite? Do you want to say that like, like, um, instead of zero, one, two versus three, you want to say like zero versus one, two, three. That's this one. Right, um, well, this, this makes you think. <laughs> Like, instead of saying, like, the lower compared to the higher, you want to do higher compared to the lower. Uh, higher that's an intercept. Okay. Yep. So, remember, thresholds tell you the probability of a zero at theta equals zero. Oh, so it's mu. Uh, yeah. Intercepts tell you the probability of a one instead. And because we're in logits and probits, which are symmetric, Sorry, minus one, whatever that word was, I've already lost it, Ahmed. Can you put it in the chat again? Something. How do you think oh, something? Additive inverse. Additive inverse. Okay. Additive. All right. Uh, minus one. <laughs> Times minus one. Yeah. So yeah, the, the models for ordinal data, this is slide nine. So this is what's known as the graded response model. It has a cumulative link function. So what differentiates different models for categorical data is the type of link function that it uses to cut it up into binary submodels. This is a cumulative version because each submodel includes all the possible answers. And it enforces the idea that you have to have more theta to move each step up across the submodels. It takes more theta to go from 1, 2, 3, to go to 2, 3, to go to 3. Each step should require more. So you can write this, and I have the logit link function here as an example, but it can be probits too, it doesn't matter. And so it's A times theta minus B, which translates into a probability prediction that looks like this, E to the model over 1 plus E to the model. The same is true on the bottom, except that we're using the IFA parameterization instead where we have these stupid thresholds with the minus sign out front canceling the minus one. So it turns into an intercept at that point. Minus threshold is the same as an intercept than the factor loadings. 
So B1, B2, B3, these are three separate difficulties, one for each transition. So B1 is the amount of theta it takes to have a 50-50 probability of blue instead of red. B2 is 50-50 amount of theta it takes to have a 50-50 probability of blue instead of red. B3, same thing. The only difference is what blue means. So blue is the 1, red is the 0 in each of these models. A sub I does not have numbers after it. What does that mean? Item difficulty. Yeah. Constant across the submodels for an item. But the sub I means each item still gets a different A. The original version of the graded response model, uh, Samajima, I want to say, 1960-something, uh, it's written this way. So it's analogous to a 2PL. So I think in my um, example slides with M+, I call it 2PL-ish, because that's why. It's analogous to the 2PL in that each item gets a separate discrimination and however many difficulties it needs to to divide up the binary submodels. Likewise, the stupid threshold things, one, two, three, because the threshold one is going to tell us the low jitter probit of a response of red. Threshold two is the low jitter, low jitter probit of a response of red, and the same thing, just which changes what red means. That means an intercept would tell us which color instead. Yeah, blue. Intercept is for blue and threshold is for red. And lambda has an I and not a number because, yep, same reason A. So lambda is assumed constant across the submodels, but differs across items. And this idea of a constant slope across submodels is otherwise known as a proportional odds assumption, if you're talking about this in the context of ordinal regression, where we would have observed predictors rather than latent predictors. And it's the part that's always bothered me about this model. So it's like you're telling me that because the data are ordinal, I need a special model for that. You can't just pretend they're continuous. Okay, seems reasonable enough. Now what are we going to do? We're going to talk about the effect of the trait on the predicted response, and you're telling me it doesn't matter which response we're predicting? The effect of the trait is the same regardless of whether we're predicting the first one, the second one, or the third one? Really? But yes. To the best of my knowledge, this is not ever questioned. Could it be questioned? Certainly. But could, could you find it in software? Not likely. You would also need a lot of data to be able to say whether or not each of these A's needs to be different from each other across submodels or each of the loadings needs to be different across submodels. And if you want to know what the probability of each response option is, you have to subtract between the submodels. So if I want to know what is the probability of a zero conditional on my trait and my item parameters, then that is directly the opposite of what's given in the first submodel here. The logit is predicting the 1, 2, 3, so 1 minus that must tell me what's left is the 0. Likewise, the probability of a 3 is given directly by the last submodel. Anything in the middle is subtracting between the two. So if I want to know the probability of a 1, then I have, sub have to subtract the probability of 1, 2, 3 minus 2, 3, and then I get the 1. So these are known as indirect models because of that. Want to see some pictures? Picture time. So these are category response curves for one item, one item that has four categories. And this version of the picture, I think, is most useful to illustrate what the Bs mean. So in this picture, each B is the point on theta at which the next option has a probability of 50-50. So to cross from 0 to 1, 2, 3, that happens at a theta of minus 2. To go from 0, 1 to 2, 3, that happens at a theta of 0. And to go from 0, 1, 2 into 3 
happens at a theta of 2. And all of these curves are parallel because they share the same A across the submodels. This is what it would look like if A was stronger, more discriminating. So right off the bat, what do you think the consequences of switching from a binary response format to an ordinal response format should be for reliability? If we think about like the sections of theta that each item is designed for, Yes. So what do you think the consequences might be from switching from a binary response format to an ordinal response format for reliability? Should it make it better or worse? Or the same, I guess. Those are three choices. Information is to say better. Yeah. We're zeroing in on particular areas. Exactly. So it's, it's not the same as if you had four different items because you don't have four separate pieces of data, but it's better than having only one of these curves, which is essentially what a binary item would be. So the extra response options allow you to differentiate people further along the continuum. The other version of the plot is more useful for describing how the model directly predicts the probability of each response. And this is what, at the end of class, Nikki, you were started saying, like, if I start with this one and subtract this one, then I get the middle. That's this version. So you'll have a couple of these at, in uh, homework four. The very last section of homework four, which is what we're talking about now, you can still do sections one, two, three anytime you'd like. But this works out then, what is the probability of each response at every level of theta, as predicted by the model? So the probability of y equals 0 is the highest until we hit minus 2, then it switches to a probability of 1, then 2, and 3. So this is more directly informative of like, my theta is 3, what am I going to get? You're likely to get a 3. My theta is 0, what's most likely? Somewhere between 1 and 2. So this is what we want to see is that these curves are differentiated and that there is, each of them is most likely somewhere, like there's an option for everybody kind of thing, as opposed to a plot that looks like this. This plot was made by switching A from a 2 to a 0.5. So now it looks like the middle categories are not very helpful. Because where pink is most likely zero is still more likely than that. So when you see these sort of collapsing in on each other, that's not a good item. So practically, if mm -hmm. you saw this, yeah. would one potential response, right? Like let's say we're doing like scale validation or something like that, mm -hmm. would it be potentially to just move between, like collapse the items because like the middle items essentially aren't helping out? The middle categories. Right, right. So yes. response options, instead of having four, we would just go to two. Yeah, if all the items look like this, I'd say you have more choices than you need. Or that people are not good at figuring out what the middle differences are. Hmm? As it's fascinating. Yeah, so like if you have choices like, you know, rarely and sometimes, and that like you, know, you get into sort of semantic distinctions, like what's more, critically or essentially, you know, or extremely? Like, if you, if you have a lot of choices, like, in theory, that helps people because it introduces more variability, but only to the extent that they know what you're talking about. So, yes, if you see sort of a big pile in the middle like this, that's not good. Here's an example, a real-world example. Thank you for the transition. So this was actually a consulting project that I got to do for a former student who was working at um, a school district level office, and they were interested in measuring some traits. They had six traits. What they are isn't really relevant for our purposes. But this is the end summary of a series of analyses that I did, and I really like these pictures, so I just want to play, show you them to you. But what I have here are item responses for a set of, it's 30 items. Each item is measuring one thing, and it's five items per trait. So not a lot of items, not a lot of information, but each item has four possibilities. And the choices were, how often do you do this thing? 
where they want people to do things more. Like this is a encouraging, you know, good practice, good behavior kind of thing. Never, seldom, sometimes, and often. So the red bars here are the A parameters per item. And so you'll note that each item has one value because A is the same across the submodels for that item. So there's 30 separate A's. On the bottom here, these are depicting the B locations. So item difficulty where the latent trait is actually on the Y axis here so that I could show the picture. And so the bottom one, the blue diamonds, are showing the theta at which you transition from never to something greater than never. So that happens at like super low thetas here. Green is the transition from never and seldom versus something greater than seldom. So that's still pretty low, theta of negative two. Then we have the transition from never sometimes, never seldom sometimes into often, which happens where the oranges are. So a couple things here. Some of these items don't have blue ones in them. Why not? Can you guess? I'm assuming they're behind, technically behind the greens. They would be behind the greens, except dot, 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 dot. Can you think of a reason why I wouldn't have blues for some of the items? Oh, no one would like never. No one said never. So I, I commented on a couple of homeworks about this. Um, why, like, just because they offered four responses for every question doesn't mean they all got used. So I asked you to report the observed minimum and maximum for that reason. The other reason is that this, apt, this lack of options is going to potentially make the code more cumbersome to create difficulties out of thresholds. Yes, no one answered never. Correct, Zoomers. So with respect to, say, this last item right here that only has green and orange, according to M+, the first threshold for this last item is going to be the green one. The second is the orange one. For every other item, the first one is blue, the second is green, and the third is orange. So it only counts, like it doesn't know what was missing, it doesn't know what was supposed to be there. So when you're getting your results back, like this one will be labeled dollar sign one, but then all the blue ones will be labeled dollar sign one as well. You see what I mean? It doesn't know that this was supposed to be dollar sign two. Because it's just like, well, that's the lowest number. That must be the first threshold. So knowing which answer categories were used is essential to interpreting what the thresholds mean. Likewise, if one, if a middle category got skipped, then the next dollar sign one would refer to the one that's beyond that because it got skipped. So the oranges top out around a theta of one, give or take, is it minus one to, to one? And here is my information function for these six traits. That's why I have separate lines, one for each trait, converted into reliability. And look what happens right before a theta of one. It tanks. Coincidence or consequence of my items? Consequence. I don't have another category to differentiate high people. The highest you can be is often. So reliability tanks after that point. Now what if you were interested in measuring everybody well? Can you think of a way to fix this? By design, not by math? Yeah, can you think of something past often? Always. Yeah, always, almost always, most of the time, frequently, I don't know. I'd go with almost always. You could actually go almost always and always if you wanted to, because we've got never and seldom. But yeah, that's and so that was one of the recommendations we made is turn this into a five category response to further differentiate among the high people. So you could either add items that shift the location all the way up, or you could add categories to capture high people.
Now, if we just go with which items are highly discriminating, we may be missing part of the story. So like the most discriminating item is this one right here in the middle where my mouse is. If I look at its corresponding difficulty location, it's very narrow relative to the others. So this is where that discrimination is relevant. It's just within this narrow range right here. So is that a good item? Only for some people, only within that narrow range. The ones that are spread the furthest tend to have the lowest discrimination, it looks like. And I, I think that, that that makes sense, in the sense that you can't do everything well. Okay, questions, comments? All right. Um, yeah, please. Um, sorry, sorry, just in chat. Oh, yes. The vertical gray lines and black lines describe. The vertical gray lines and black lines. Uh, <laughs> which ones? Is it? You mean these ones? Yeah. yeah so some, some of them are kind of highlighted gray, gray versus oh. just a straight black, black line. line. <laughs> uh, I believe that was to make a point that the straight black lines don't have a blue. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so no. Yeah. So those ones are missing one of the submodels. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> no, sorry to miss your comment here. No, no I just I, I literally, literally just posted, just posted it. <laughs> okay. Good. Then I won't I won't apologize too profusely. But yes. So knowing which answers were used then will help you figure out what the submodels mean. And M plus just starts from the bottom and counts up. So it won't know if you're missing some. Now this is both good and bad. What if some of these items had a different response format? So a few of you had items where they were mixed, like some of them would have this type of response format and others would switch to like agree, disagree, or other kinds of grad gradients like that. The idea that each item has its own set of thresholds means that all the answer choices don't have to be of the same kind. Like the first threshold for item five can be whatever two words go with that threshold. They don't have to be the same as all the other items. All right. Do you want to see what something like this would look like in M plus? Yes, I think that'd be good because the next, the other ones are just variations on the same model, and we're not, we're not going to do that yet. We're going to do this. This is example six A. So these are the same data that we looked at for example five, seven activities of daily living in older adults, except this is a different response format. So it was collected in a four category version of can't do it at all, big problems doing it, some problems doing it, and can do it. And here are the frequencies of each of these categories. Most of the people have a three. So we're still going to have the same problem with respect to not measuring people of high abilities well, because these are all relatively low items in terms of the amount of trait that's required to do them successfully. But what this will do is better differentiate the people who need help. Can't do it at all is different than I can do it just sometimes. Same idea in terms of data description to start with, only instead of tetracorks, we have a new word, polycork, but it's the same idea. Yes? Lisa, in the slide, you said that for the greater response model, mm -hmm. we do not need the same amount of options? Yes. It's slide eight. Slide eight. Yeah. Correct. So, but what is, the meaning of, what is the meaning of that? We do not need the same labels, but the same amount of options, or we do not need the same amount of options given? Both. Okay. Both. So let's say that in my, in my example here, let's say that this last item, rather than just nobody answering never, this was measured like with I agree, neutral, I disagree. Mm -hmm. So not only is it three choices instead of four, but what the choices mean is completely different, that's fine. Because okay. this threshold just refers to that choice for that item, whatever it happened to be. So that's advantageous if you, say, screw up your survey. 
So I'm on uh, Facebook. There is a psychological methods discussion group where people like post like they need help with stuff, and and, and those of us who happen to be scrolling by might stop and give them some help. And that's a common one. It's like, I put this survey, but then I realized that for 10 of my items, I left off one of the answer choices. How screwed am I? Is basically the question they ask. And the answer is, well, are you going to add your items up? Because then you're a little bit screwed. Are you going to just let the thresholds be what they are? Then you'd have to say, well, my measurement suffers because of the lack of option for these items relative to these other items, but it's not a problem in terms of the math. We can just estimate whatever thresholds, however many you need. So you can mix binary items with ordinal items, items that have three categories, four categories, five categories, different labels, it doesn't matter. Because there's no like constraints or relationships across items and what the thresholds mean in this model. In others there are, but not in this one. So that's why I think it's probably going to be the most useful. Okay. So polychoric correlations is what I have here. Same idea as tetrachoric, but with ordinal data instead. So it's like if I took this circle of the area of each potential response pattern and I further subdivided the areas into answers of 0, 1, 2, 3, um, I found a website that rather than try, try to figure, try to take their stuff and, and teach with it, I'm like, here, just go here. I found someone else's notes on this that do a much better job, and they use R. So you can like play with stuff with that. But the idea of polychoric, though, is the same idea. It's trying to get around the range restriction problem that you have a finite set of responses. Um, the difference relative to Pearson correlations in these data is not quite as striking as it was for binary. So I've got the Pearson estimates. If we pretended these items were continuous variables and we fit a CFA, that would be trying to recreate the Pearson correlation matrix whereas the ordinal version of this model is trying to recreate the polychoric correlations. So for some of you, um, you had correlations among your items that were not very strong in homework three. This might be one reason why, particularly if you have skewed data. The polychoric correlations may turn out to be a little bit better behaved. So all hope is not lost, that's what I'm saying. And I have the standard errors of these as well. Um, item 7 is still the one where most of, it's basically a constant, 88% of the sample answered in the last category with very little information over here. So all of the standard errors related to item 7 are a little bit higher because it's less certain like what that correlation would be that would generate its pattern of responses relative to any of the other items. Otherwise, here's what the syntax would look like. Let me zoom in on one side here, and you can tell me whether it looks the same as what we did for binary or different. So all this part, data, format, same as binary and CFA or different? Same. same. Names and use variables? Same. same. Categorical equals? Same. That is what we had for binary too. So it will figure out, based on your observed data, how many binary submodels it needs to make for each item and do it. You don't have to tell it that. You don't have to say this item has two choices, this item has three, it figures it out. But this categorical is actually somewhat misleading because what it really means is ordinal. If you have nominal data instead, remember what kind that is? Nominal, where they're not ordered? like favorite ice cream flavor, favorite pet, that kind of thing, then can you guess what the word would be instead of categorical? Ordinal or nominal? Nominal, yeah. So categorical is, is really ordinal, but nominal is nominal. Uh, other choices include count for Poisson, negative binomial, and all the zero inflated and hurdle versions of those. So that's all the same. Missing data, all the same. ID variable, all the same. Uh, I'm using full information, maximum likelihood to start with, in which case you can choose between logits and probits. I'm picking logits for right now. Tech 10 is how we do local misfit and ML, which is painful, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that too much. We'll look at fit with respect to the limited information estimator that gives us 
Uh, the regular fits to six given the event of an H1 saturated model. Uh, save data. So this, by the way, if this breaks on you, you might have to put your path to where the file is supposed to go on M plus and try to use the H drive if your path is too long. And I have this as theta's 2p-ish because I'm using the graded response model, but it's analogous to a 2pl. So that's, that's why I named it that way. The same thing with the plots. It, this may throw an error potentially when it generate plot 3 in particular because that has descriptives related to data. Questions? You mentioned like the plot is visible to see if there's a window plot. Can you come up with that? Last I heard that was true. But if, if you're using M plus on the virtual desktop, that is a Windows server. It's just that if you had a personal copy of M plus and it was installed on a Mac, then there, there's some limitations as to the plots, I think. Oh, plot that grayed out when I used this on my Mac. On your Mac. Okay. So, yep, then that hasn't changed. So, for that reason, by the way, in Homework 4, I ask you to refer to some plots. I made them for you. They're in the Excel spreadsheet that goes with, I think it's a file called Plots that are in the download folder because I was anticipating that they would still be broken for Max. So I made all the plots that you would have to refer to. And that just means when it comes time for homework five that you may need to log in and use the virtual desktop to make pictures or borrow someone's copy of M plus temporarily. Um, it has been that way for a long enough time that I don't know if they plan to fix it. Okay. In terms of model code, What's this do? Loadings. Loadings. Same or different? Different. The, this part's different. The rest of it the looks the same. Do I need the star here, or is that extra? Uh. That's needed. It is needed if I want to take my factor variance and fix it to 1. Because if I don't have the star, what it's going to do is fix the first item's loading to one against my will. The star makes it so that all seven are estimated. So I have a loading system here where it's L underscore and then the item that the loading is for, which is more elaborate than what I had before, but there's a reason for that. And it understands that if I do I1 dash I7, that I mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is just a loading label. It is not a constraint. Because I've given it seven labels for the seven parameters. One thing that I forgot to mention in class, I think, what happens if I have all my items on the line and I need to return because it gets too long? And I try to do that. It breaks. The rule about the labels is that they have to be on the same physical line of code to be implemented. It's a lazy programming trick. So if you had a situation where let's say you had a total of 24 items or something, then you would want to do like one line and the loadings, the next line items and the loadings, the next line the items and the loadings, and then one semicolon at the end of the whole thing but the labels have to be on the same physical line of code as the parameters that they refer to. I know! I ran into so much trouble with that on homework three. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's not your fault. You didn't select the items. I didn't, but um, it, that, that's the kind of thing where you... do 12. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. By the way, um, I called them G or I, but you can label them however you want. So, like, there's nothing that stops you from saying I1, I2, I3, like, as short as possible. It doesn't know what they used to be called. So, now this is the new part. Okay, is everyone listening? Zoomers, are you listening? Rumors, are you listening? Okay, on your homework, don't type the thresholds. Don't do this. Do not put this in there, okay? Because... In your homework data, the gambling data, some of the items don't use all the choices. And if you try to list all possible thresholds, 
and it finds one that doesn't match the data, it will yell at you. And it's a very long and tedious process to figure out for 24 different items how many separate thresholds you might need. Because that response format has six categories. So how many binary submodels would I need for an item that has six categories? Five times 24 items is a lot of typing. Do you know what M plus will do if you just don't have any of this? Make them. Make them for you. So if all you want to do is estimate them, you do not have to type them. They are default. Now, why did I bother to type them? Transparency. Transparency. That's always one. But it's actually this part right here. Because I needed to label them in order to do math on them. Because M plus will not make the A's and B's for you in ordinal models. You have to make them yourself. So I'm doing it as the conversion formulas, which require labeling the thresholds and labeling the loadings. So inside the brackets, more generally, what goes inside brackets in M plus? What is it referring to? Mm -hmm. Means and? Variances? Not variances. Variances are outside brackets. Intercepts. Intercepts. And what are the dollar signs mean? Thresholds. Yeah, stupid thresholds. Dollar sign one for item one through dollar sign one through item seven. So this is the first threshold for all seven items. The next row is the second threshold for all seven items. So the first one is zero versus one, two, three. The second one is zero, one versus two, three. And the third one is zero, one, two versus three. So for any item then that didn't have a response, these are going to be off in terms of what they mean. So an item, if an item didn't have category zero, then the first threshold for that item would actually be one versus two, three, which would be labeled as threshold two for all the other items. Next is identification. I have both the factor mean and variance set to be estimated up to this point because I wanted the code that I give you to work for all different situations, but right away down here under model constraint, I'm fixing them to the values that I want them to be. So model constraint is a process that allows you to put constraints, like make this parameter this, or make these things equal, or make this difference zero, like whatever constraint you want, but it also allows you to make new parameters. So I did it this way, that way the code will work even if you needed to estimate the factor mean and variance. So everywhere in the code below, factor mean refers to what the factor mean would be in your model, and factor variance, that word, refers to what it would be. In our case, it's 0 and 1. But more generally, that may not be true. Then the rest of this is making A's and B's. So new is the first thing. It says, what new terms would you like to make? I need you to label those for me. Okay. I would like to make seven A's, one for each item. I would like to make seven B1 difficulties, seven B2 difficulties, and seven B3 difficulties. So we're talking about the, the binary submodels and the corresponding fees that go with them. So I'm trying to go from threshold, stupid thresholds, to not stupid bees. First is the A. So this is like a little loop. So it starts at the beginning item number and ends at the last item number. And so I have A where this, this thing, this pound sign slash hashtag, otherwise known as a number, will fill in the first time through it'll be one, the second time through it'll be two, all the way up to seven. And so A equals the loading times the square root of the factor variance. So if this is one, then A and L are the same. But again, the code works more generally in case your factor variance is not one. Then we got the three sets of difficulties. It's threshold 
for that item minus the loading for that item times the factor mean, so that's the part that usually drops out, divided by the loading times the square root of the factor variance. And that part usually reduces to threshold divided by loading. Where those came from is this slide. This is slide 60 in lecture 5. These are the conversions that are used in the theta parameterization specifically. There's a different set of formulas if you do delta instead. But that's where these came from. So the end result is that in addition to your loadings and stupid thresholds, part of your output will now be A's and B's that I have made here. And because M plus is estimating them, it is going to also create standard errors for them that can be reported, which is the advantage of doing it this way over Excel or a calculator. Is there a way, so you previously talked about how that, where your cursor is right now, like, mm -hmm. don't do that for the homework. How, is Don't there, do this for the homework. Yes. Don't write them. Is there a way to get the IRT parameters with things that aren't? Well, does that make sense? There is not. Okay. Because it has to have a, a label attached to what the number is eventually going to be, and the label is like a placeholder for that number. Yep. So, so in... If we essentially, if, I'm understanding what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, the, if we're like missing responses on some of our items... Missing certain categories ca for certain yes. items, yes. Um, we can't necessarily switch between those things. Like, if they're doing, if M plus is IFA, mm -hmm. we can't necessarily convert to IRT? You can, but this system of abbreviating all the thresholds with the, the dash and then doing the loops, you have to, like, start writing things out manually because not every item is going to have every threshold. Yes. Okay. So in your homework, I asked for one threshold to be converted into a difficulty, just one number. So write that one number and label it, and then just like one little little equation down here, or get your calculator out, I don't care, because I don't think I asked for a standard error. So that's all, just one, not 24 of them. And for homework five, that's where you get to play with it with your own data. So that may be a more laborious process, or you can plug it into a spreadsheet. Conveniently, I think all 12 of my items have the same no, just kidding. No, just kidding. Yeah, no, just th kidding. then it gets to be a little more laborious. But at least it's your data and you should care at that, that point, as opposed to writing, you know, lots and lots of code for canned data. Okay, questions. So, big picture. Ordinal data works the same as binary data, except each item has multiple submodels that divide it up into binary. M plus will not give you A's and B's, but you can ask for them as versions of the, the thresholds and, and loadings that you do get. The other side to this is an example of a constraint and a label. So right there, what's happening? What's happening if I switch out seven L's with one L? Making them equal. Yeah. So then this is a analog of a 1PL Roche model. This is a model that says all the items are equally discriminating. And so then I adjusted the code to use the 1L instead, which requires uh, first making separate loadings, in which I literally just set them all to be equal to the 1, and then the rest of the code works exactly the same. So just a workaround. So the graded response model is a 2PL version, but there's nothing that stops you from testing the same hypothesis about equally discriminating items as a 1PL-ish type constraint on it. It just doesn't have a name. I'd call it a constrained graded response model. All right. Last question, and then I'll let you go. What happened to my model fit? This is all I got. Where's my CFI and RMSEA and SRMR and TLI and all that stuff? It's not CFA. It's not CFA. 
But we had it at the end of the binary data, didn't we? We got we brought. Well, Jesus, you need variants. Well, you would like each function needs its own. Mm, nope. Wait. What kind of estimation are we using? Here. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the diagonal? Maximum value. Ah, yeah. Yeah, not That's the diagonal one. The yeah. other one. Yeah, this is full information. So the, the, the full information version of this is a seven-way contingency table is H1. So we don't have any model fit because we don't have the answer key in full information. That's where I, the rest of the stuff isn't here. H1 model's not here. At the end of the handout, I'll bring it back, same as before. All right. Any other questions before we call it a day? Zoomers, anything? All right, then office hours tomorrow. You have homework to work on. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks for being here. Bye, Zoomers.